Thank you, band, for um, leading us so well this morning. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Chris. I'm one of um, the four elders here who lead the church um, as a team. And um, it's my uh, privilege to carry on our series on what it, our kind of core values are um, as a church and uh, what, what makes us do things the way we do here at Ascot Life Church. And, um, and today I've been given the topic of um, We Are Family, and there is a certain song that's been going around my head all week as I've been thinking about this. So I was going to inflict it on you this morning, but I thought better of it. Um, so I won't do that to you, but now it's in your head as well, I'm sure. So we started this series with um, Simon talking about our core beliefs as a church, and then last week Phil Rogers explained how the church operates uh, like a body with many parts who each need each other. I'm going to touch a little bit on that today, but my topic is the church as a family. Now, it's a little bit ironic that this week of all weeks is the week that I'm speaking about the church as a family, because this is the first week in probably 22 years that I've not had one of my children um, in church with me, because Martha left home about a year ago and went to Brighton, and uh, last week Lou and I took Hannah down to Swansea to settle her into uni. So sad times in the Collison household. Um, we've, uh, things have changed a little bit. Um, and Hannah's doing fine, by the way. Thank you for your prayer. She's doing great. Uh, and we're doing fine as well. Okay, so thank you. But, uh, keep praying. Keep going. Okay, but just because Martha is now in Brighton and Hannah is now in Swansea, something about the beach in our family, um, it doesn't mean that they cease to become part of my family. Of course it doesn't. That's a permanent status. Whether they like it or not, they are part of our family. And the same is true of our relationship with God's family. And that's what I want to unpack today as we think about God's family and our role within it and how exciting that is and what that means for our church life and, in fact, our family life as well and how it feeds back in. Um, I want to start with um, a verse from um, Ephesians 2 where Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus and just affirming these new believers as to the fact that they have a brand new status. And Paul says, now you are no longer strangers to God and foreigners to heaven, but you are members of God's very own family, citizens of God's country, and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. A powerful verse, isn't it? Lovely to know that we are members of God's very own family. Now, Paul isn't saying, you know, when you come to church on a Sunday, you can kind of think of it as like a nice, cuddly family, and everyone's nice to you, and isn't that good? He's not saying that. It's not saying it's a nice metaphor for how we should be together, or how we can be together. What he's saying is much more profound than that. He's saying we really are a family, and this church family that we've been put into has even a greater significance than the biological families that we've been born into, because we have the same father. Um, as Phil mentioned last week, um, if we're Christians, if we've reached that point in our lives where we've admitted that actually, however hard we try, we screw things up. We don't have the power um, or, the, or the will or the strength to live lives that measure up to God's standards. If we believe that Jesus is who he said he was, um, that he was the Son of God, and that when he died, as we've been singing this morning, um, that death on the cross changes things for us if we accept that that death on the cross brings us forgiveness for our sins. And if we commit to follow him, um, then we are born from above in the way Phil described last week. And as God looks, looks down on us, if you like, what he sees in us is something different. He sees almost like we have a spiritual DNA, if you like, because we have the Holy Spirit living within us. So as Paul writes, we're not strangers or foreigners to heaven. We're members of God's own family. And that is an eternal change of status. It's a family that will last forever, an eternal family. Now, have a look around the room. Get used to seeing all of those faces because you're going to be seeing them forever. Now, that's, uh, that's kind of the good news in all of this is that we will be made perfect. So most of us will be pretty much unrecognizable from the way we are now. Um, some of us, maybe not so, but no, that, <laughs> actually, even, even with hair, you wouldn't recognize me. So being made perfect, I would completely off the scale, believe you me. 
Now, <laughs> but it's seriously, it's true to say that our spiritual family is actually more important than our biological family. Now, that sounds a bit controversial, um, but if we truly believe that we are part of God's very own family, and we understand how amazing and how eternal that is, my family life on earth will be how many years I'm given, 80, 90, who knows what, um, but I'm part of an eternal family. So if I see things in that kind of perspective, it changes how I see the importance of being part of God's family on earth. And as we see things in perspective, of course, we yearn for members of our own biological families to also become part of God's eternal family, don't we? It's almost like you've got double DNA matching. You know, not only are we the same DNA biologically, but we have this kind of spiritual uh, DNA, if you like, um, because they're part of God's family as well. And understanding that is, is really important for us. It's important that we grasp um, what we're meant to understand about being part of God's family. In fact, it's so important that we must never let our own experience of family life limit our expectations of what the church family can be. Because no human family is anywhere near perfect. In fact, earthly families can be pretty tough places at some time. At some, time. some of us might have had really hard family experiences at some time. Maybe you don't even find yourself in a family context at the moment. So let me say something. Whether you were blessed to grow up in a kind of Enid Blyton, roses around the door family, um, or if your family life was more like a Roald Dahl book, perhaps, but you were more like, felt more like Matilda, um, or James the Giant Peach, or Charlie Bucket in the Charlie and Chocolate Factory, or if your experience was more like Tracy Beaker, the kind of family that God wants you to experience in his church, his family, is much better than the best parts of any of our families. God's standard, his bar, is so much higher than anything we can do. So you could say that rather than family life being a model for how church can be, which is often how we think, um, actually church life should be a model for how our families could be because it's so much better. So you know, we, don't, we don't say, oh, if only the church was more, more like my family. We say, no, if only my family was more like what I see in the church of God's grace, wouldn't that be a great place to be? So I want to look at 10 things reasonably quickly um, that we can do, things that we can be, values that we can demonstrate that you'll recognize in bits and pieces of the best of family life uh, around this church. Um, and then the Holy Spirit takes that. Uh, in a church context and does something miraculous and amazing. So these are my sort of 10 family values, if you like, for us at Ascot Life Church. And I'm going to take us through them for the rest of this time and maybe pause to pray uh, once or twice as we go through it. So value number one is that we celebrate that we share the same spiritual DNA. So what do I mean by that? People say um, you can choose your friends, <laughs> but you can't choose your family. Well, Jesus turns that completely on its head uh, because he chose us to be part of his family. In Ephesians 1 verse 4, Paul writes, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Now, we could preach a whole sermon on that, I'm sure, but this idea that he chose us before the world was even created is amazing, and it gave him pleasure to choose you before the world was created. And then in Romans 8, 14, um, Paul writes, for those who are led by the Spirit of God and are the children of God, the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought you, brought about your adoption to sonship. So we are sons and daughters, not slaves in any way. So we were chosen, we're sons and daughters, we have this new spiritual identity. Now imagine, um, I'm sure you're familiar with the TV show, um, Who Do You Think You Are? Where they take a celebrity usually and then go back through their, their past and discover things about distant relationships on the family tree that they had no idea that their great, great, great uncle um, was uh, Nelson or whatever it might be. Now imagine I'm on that show. Um, it would probably be the most boring edition of the show because there's nothing particularly scandalous or exciting or heroic in, uh, in my family tree as far as I'm aware. 
But then imagine they get to the point where the narrator says, um, well, actually, uh, there's just one other dimension to Chris's family tree we need to talk about, in that actually Jesus is his brother. Just imagine the, the twist, the plot twist in, uh, in the show then. And um, you know what? That would be absolutely true to say in Hebrews 2, this is a wonderful, wonderful verse. And for Andy, Andy Moore alluded to it earlier this morning. Uh, the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 2, um, he says, In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, that's you and me, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation, that's Jesus, perfect through what he suffered, which is what we sung about today. Both the one who makes people holy, Jesus, and those who are made holy, that's you and me, are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Isn't that amazing that we can call Jesus our brother? Because it says so in the word. He's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. He delights in us being adopted into his family. So that's the first of our kind of family values, that we just delight in being part of that family, and having that kind of spiritual DNA. The second family value is, and you would have expected this one, that we love each other. Jesus said himself, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. It's a distinctive characteristic of his people. And you won't see that kind of characteristic in a sports club or a social club or a book club. Church is different. Church family is meant to be different because uh, we are meant to be demonstrating how much we love each other. And it's a different kind of love. Um, the, the word that's used in this context is the word agape. Um, and it's the kind of love that's described as active goodwill and benevolence towards each other. It's something that we do. It's an active love. It shows in the way that we do it. People notice it. Um, and you know what? It doesn't come naturally to us. It comes supernaturally to us. That's how the kind of love that we need. And, and it's the Holy Spirit that enables us and transforms us to be able to love each other in that way. So what does that love look like? I'm going to ask us to pray in a moment. Just I'm going to read some familiar verses. But as you think about how do I demonstrate, how can I demonstrate what it means to love my church family. I'm going to read some familiar verses and just ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, will you please just touch our hearts and do some fine tuning on how we love each other as a church, as we read your word. Just so as, this, as I read through this, just let the Holy Spirit speak to you and say, is this something where actually I could do with turning it up a little bit? Is this something where I'm perhaps prone to fail? Okay. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Father, we have so much work for you to do in our lives that we would demonstrate what it means to truly love each other. So, Father, I just pray that you will work on us, Lord, over the, the weeks and months. Just touch those areas in our lives where we need help. We need your help to really glorify you and love each other in the way that you would have us do that. Amen. I mean, have me at love is patient, I have to say. First line, first verse, I'm, I'm, that was me. I was gone. Um, so, we see this love, this agape love, demonstrated in that way. And we also see it in how we respect each other. Um, in the church. In 1, 1 Timothy 5 2, um, Paul writes, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he was your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. So, so Paul again is encouraging us to think about the family dynamic perfected in the church context. And in this church, we cherish the elderly. We love hearing them. I love that so many of the, the things that people brought in this church this morning came from people who are in their later years. It's brilliant. I love that. We love hearing from older people. We love involving them, being blessed by their prayers and their life experience. And we probably need to do more 
for you older people in this church. Um, please let us know what else we can do um, that you really feel blessed as part of this family. Number three, as church, one of our values, if you like, one of the things we can do, we hurt together uh, and we celebrate together too. In his letter to the Romans, Paul encouraged us to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. And in the letter to Galatians, he said, bear one another's burdens. So we're encouraged to be doing those things. But we can't do that if we're not really interested in each other. Um, we need to be open with each other as well. So if we don't know what our needs are and we're not interested, then the idea that we can bear each other's burdens um, is, uh, is going to be tricky. I wonder if somebody could maybe just crack open a couple of windows at the side. It feels like it's getting a little bit warm in here. I'm seeing a few fans waving, so if you could do that, that would be great. And you know what? In a family context, it's easier to be able to kind of say things like, are you sure everything's okay? Are you worrying about something? In a family context, we have kind of permission to ask, don't we? Permission to speak into each other's lives. And maybe there's more we can do in this church to demonstrate that family sense by being able to speak into each other's lives. But it's okay to say, are you sure you're okay? Uh, you just look a bit, a bit like you're worried, you're concerned about something. Is there anything I can do? Which leads me to number four, which is that we pray for each other and we pray with each other. Now, um, just kind of, a, I guess, a family story. My, uh, my wife's grandparents, Alan and Joan, um, who uh, I, I got to know, I lived with them for three months while I was at university. They had a habit of praying every morning for every single member of, um, of, of the family. Uh, the extended family, and uh, I was living at their house, and sometimes I really wanted to go, but it was the family prayer time, and I, it would be rude not to, so we kind of, come on, granddad, we need to go, and every, every day, without fail, they would pray for every member of the family, and sadly, within almost a few months of Alan, his granddad dying, um, almost like dominoes began to fall in, in the family, marriages, relationships, and we, it was kind of, you suddenly become aware of the hidden power of faithful people praying by name for people in your family. And I know there are people here who look through the church address list and pray faithfully for uh, other members of this church family. And it's so important that we do that. And it's invisible um, for so much of the time. Um, I love it also when, uh, we, when we pray for each other at the end of services. So often now we just see little groups of people praying for each other, praying for healing, praying for encouragement, praying for whatever we need. And that's exactly the kind of church it's great to be, isn't it, where we just quickly, we don't hang about, we just let, let me pray for you. Um, it looks like that's difficult for you, or let me pray for you. I can see you're hurting. Um, let's be more like that as church. Let's reach out to people like that. Okay, number five. Um, we connect with each other a lot as family. We kind of know what's going on. We're in and out of each other's lives a bit more, and that enables us to pray for each other. But we sort of need more than just a few minutes on a Sunday morning, don't we? Uh, we need more than those quick 10 minutes over coffee before we're packing up chairs and getting children and, and trying to see everybody or to see and looking over someone's shoulder while we're talking to them about something else. It's a bit frenetic sometimes on a, on a Sunday morning. Uh, and that's why we try and create other areas where we can get together. So that's why we have a good menu of group activities, people meeting for Bible studies or meeting socially or meeting for hobbies. Um, and you can go to, if you're new here, um, ascotlife.info um, is our um, kind of internally focused facing website that gives you a menu of things you can choose from. So please do plug yourselves into any of the groups that we have going, as well as some of the courses that people are leading on. And we'll make some room for here about the courses perhaps during our notices time later. But there's also a whole lot of informal connections, a whole lot of um, coffees together and drinks together and people walking dogs together, prayer partnerships, prayer triplets, um, WhatsApp groups, Facebook chats. There's a whole ecosystem of connections in this church that we would love you to get connected into. It's part of how we do life together. Um, it's not just a Sunday thing. Don't let it become that. And you know what, as we find ourselves doing life together, in that way, being in and out of each other's lives like we are, it's sometimes possible, and I find, Lou and I find, I find myself doing this with Lou sometimes, where maybe we're walking around Virginia Water or walking somewhere with a dog and just chatting to each other about somebody we know in church. And we say, oh, it's so sad, isn't it? They're going through that. Oh, what a shame. And we'll talk empathetically um, about their situation, but we'll forget to pray about it. 
So, you know, full of sympathy and empathy, but actually not actually getting as far as praying. And the more we kind of know about each other's lives, in a sense, the more opportunity there is for us to talk about each other sympathetically. But I want to encourage myself and all of us to say, don't just talk sympathetically, empathetically about your brothers and sisters in church. Say, let's just pray for that. Why don't we pray? And occasionally, when I'm being uh, a good role model, I'll say, let's just pray for these people that we're talking about as we're walking around the lake or wherever wherever we're going. And I just want to encourage you to do the same because it's a really good way of taking a, a, a nice conversation and making it productive for the family. Let's turn it back to God. God can help. God can intervene. Let's stop in a way, feeling just sorry for that person and do something, and we can do something in prayer. It's also a really good antidote to slipping into gossip, which we can also be prone to do as we know more about each other's lives. It's kind of easily done. Uh, James writes a lot about how quickly, how easy it is to slide into into gossip. So I want to just challenge all of us. Maybe the next time you're out with somebody else in the church and you find yourself in one of those conversations, um, say, why don't we just pray about that now? But I'm in Costa. We can't do that. Yes, you can. Nobody knows what you're talking about. Just keep your eyes open. Don't look too weird. But just pray into that situation. That's all you need to do. Um, and it will just help check us into being productive as family rather than being a family that just talks about each other and is nice and empathizes. You get what I'm talking about. Okay. Halfway through. Let's move on through the next five values, which are a little bit shorter. You'll be glad to know. Number six, um, we eat together. Okay, eating around a table together just creates space, doesn't it? It's such a powerful and important thing to do. And that's why the early believers um, met in each other's homes and ate together. And as part of that, they broke bread together and drank wine together and gave thanks for what Jesus had done in their lives. It was just a natural part of their lives, in and out of each other's houses, eating together, uh, breaking bread together. Tell you what, in the early church, their homes were not castles in the way that we talk about uh, an Englishman's home is his castle. That's probably why the early church didn't start with the English, I expect. Um, <laughs> because uh, their homes definitely were not castles with portcullises. And maybe we just need to think a bit about how we view our homes in relation to um, not just our church family, but, but anybody. And we're encouraged to practice hospitality. And, um, and hospitality is very different to entertaining. Phil Rogers shared some really wise words once with us around this, and it's something that stayed with me. Um, the diff- what, do you think the, what, do the, what is the difference between hospitality and entertaining? Think about that. What's the difference between being hospitable and entertaining some guests? Well, Phil's wise words to me were, maybe you heard them from somebody else, I don't know, were that hospitality honors the guest, but often entertainment honors the hosts. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes it's lovely to have people around, but you're kind of enjoying a little bit of reflected glory and how lovely your food is. Uh, Whereas hospitality is focused on the needs of someone who has come into your home uh, to be an honored guest. And I think that's a really good value and a good way to think about and challenge ourselves about our motivation for inviting people to our homes. If we can err towards being hospitable rather than seeking to entertain, uh, we'll be in an even better place. Um, So one of the ways in which we honor people is honoring students. And uh, if you are a new student, if you're a fresher, please know that you will never be short of a Sunday lunch um, as long as you are part of this church family. We work hard at that. We want you to know that you're welcome and that you belong here. Now, that is not intended to be a bribe. And if, and if you know some people here, it's not intended to be a threat either. Um, it's just our expression of how we want to be family for you, okay? So please know that we do that. Whether you're together at the Life Center or at some family home, we love to give you Sunday lunches while you're with us. Okay, eating together, um, important value. What else can we do? Um, we can support each other in lots of ways. In, uh, in, in the book of Acts, um, Luke writes, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything that they had. Everything that they had, they shared. Now, that is radical living. We are not that radical here, just so you know, okay? Um, It it might be wonderful to be like that, but we are not there yet. But we do share. We do share some things. We don't share everything, um, but we're on a journey towards being more open and less holding on to our possessions that maybe possess us sometimes. So, yeah, we quite often get to hear kind of through the grapevine of, of wonderful acts of generosity and kindness, people giving, each, giving 
cars or flights or holidays or support or just professional advice or time or money, whatever it is, there are lots of little examples where that goes on within the church. And countless unseen acts that I have no idea are going on in the church, um, but, uh, but they're happening all the time. So part of what characterizes us is a willingness to support and help each other and an active desire to do that. Let's do more of that. Number eight, we encourage each other. Um, and uh, families particularly are usually um, pretty encouraging places to be. They're safe places to be. Um, I really like it when sometimes the band doesn't quite go perfectly or perfect time, and then you see how they respond and think, actually, it's just a family here, isn't it? It doesn't matter that we started the first song a bit too fast or whatever. It is. And you see the family dynamic going on in the band. We just encourage each other. It's fine. Let's start again. And, uh, and that's what encouragement is about. Um, Paul writes in Thessalonians, therefore encourage one another and build each other up. That's what it's about. How can we build each other up? Now, that doesn't mean we say you were brilliant when somebody wasn't brilliant. That's not encouragement. That's setting somebody up for, probably for a fall later on. Encouragement is something that comes before. It's about giving someone courage to do something. Yes, you can do that. Let me pray for you. Let me help you. Um, so let's see, how can we put courage into each other um, for whatever people are setting out to do? That's number eight. Number nine, we include and we accommodate each other. We sort of make allowances for each other. Now, you know there's a saying that every family has a weird uncle or, or a weird auntie, let's be fair in this one. Um, and if you don't know who the weird auntie or uncle is in your family, it's probably you, okay? <laughs> now, the truth is we are all a bit weird. You probably wouldn't get a collection of people like this in any other context other than in a church because we're a bit strange, aren't we, all of us really, in our, in our own way. Um, but we are joined together in a body and there is no... There's no hierarchy. Um, there's no sense of these people have got it sorted out and these people are a bit eccentric. It's not like that. I'm going to read something that Phil will have read last week um, from uh, Corinthians about the body. Uh, um, Paul says, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable, we treat with special honor. Modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. So let's just remember that. Let's make allowances for each other because none of us are perfect. We're all being made perfect. Um, and also we, you know, we know each other's weaknesses in many ways and we can help keep each other accountable. We can sharpen each other up. We can support each other. But let's bear with each other and make allowances for each other, recognizing where we've all come from. So we accommodate each other and we include each other. And finally, from my 10 um, family values that we can demonstrate, Maybe one of the most important ones, number 10, we forgive each other. It's really hard when there is unforgiveness in our own families. It really just, it's like, like it paralyzes everything, doesn't it? We can't have a normal family relationship where we know there's a huge block of forgiveness. It really, it does literally block things up. In, in Colossians 3, Paul writes, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. We've been forgiven so much. How can we hold stuff against other people who are part of our family? We're almost forgetting how much we've been forgiven in the first place. And, and that comes right down to practical things. In Matthew 5, Jesus said, look, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and just when you're there, you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift Leave your gift there before the altar and first go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Jesus can just see how unforgiveness just gets in the way. And in a church family, in, a, in our own families, uh, it's, a, it's a big deal. So we really need to find a way to forgive each other. And that often means making the first move. Um, yeah. Father, forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. Um, so... If you forgive those, uh, 
when people sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you don't forgive men their sins, then your Father won't forgive you. So much in the word about the importance of forgiveness. Let's not be paralyzed or held back by forgiveness. Let's enjoy the freedom that comes with knowing that we are, at, we are not at odds with anybody in the church family. So that's number 10. And just in closing, um, I guess just to say that you know, just like earthly biological families, um, we grow as a family. We want to continue to grow. We've been so blessed with growth. We love having um, a fresh input of students um, every year as well. And we love growing from other families and individuals joining us. Um, but we don't grow in our own strength. I think the more we exhibit grace as a family, the more we allow ourselves to be transformed individually into his likeness, the more we show what a supernaturally loving family can be, the more we demonstrate that we have our Father's eyes as we look at people who don't yet know Jesus. The more we know what it, show what it means to be called brothers and sisters of Jesus, then the more we will grow. The more we grow to be like him, the more we will grow as a family. And that's why we're called to be a church family. It's not because it feels loving and supportive and encouraging and forgiving and accommodating and sociable, although all those things are lovely. And we enjoy those. But that's not the primary reason. The reason we're called to be families is because it is a wonderful way to show the world what it really means to live life to the full. And it glorifies God. And this is in a world where people yearn for connections and a sense of belonging, a world where loneliness and isolation is endemic. We are infinitely so much more than any sports club or social club or pub or book club because we have something really special that we've been given. Um, it's not something we have, it's something we are. We are something special because he chose us. So let's be a church that glorifies him um, by showing the world around us what family was intended to be from the moment of creation. Let's pray together. And I think the band will lead us in a, in a final song. Father, thank you for inventing family. Lord, thank you that it was your creation, it was your intention. Uh, and Lord, thank you that you give us the opportunity to model what that looks like in, in church. Father, and I pray that you would help us to do it so much better. Lord, we want to be a church where people see what it is to be full of you, where people see what it is to truly love each other and forgive each other and bear with each other and celebrate uh, your goodness together and to suffer together and weep together. Father, would you help us to be a church that truly shows um, what it means to know you, Lord? Help us individually, um, help us in our, and help us to take some of that goodness back to our own family context, whatever those are like, Lord, and be a light and salt and a blessing wherever we can be in those. So, Father, we just thank you for your word. Thank you. There's so much that you've written about what it means to be family, Lord, and we just ask for the help of your Holy Spirit in our lives and in our church to just take us forward, Father, in being the family you want us to be. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.